So I'm going to try something that I haven't done in Reason Why before, so bear with me. It'll be real short, but it requires that I put on a different hat. And the hat is the hat of the skeptic. And so when I have this hat on, I'm going to be posing as a skeptic just for a little bit for a few comments to show you the kinds of objections you'll hear when it comes to the Christian faith in light of the Inquisition. This hat was left in my house last weekend at our Super Bowl party by my atheist father-in-law. So how fitting is it that I'm wearing the atheist cap today? See, Christianity has a bunch of problems, and this is why I can't be a Christian. See, if, namely, if you just look at the historical record of how people in the name of Christ have done such horrible things, and we could easily write that off by just saying, well, what does that have to do with Jesus? It wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for so long. Now, last month, we did the Crusades. And sure, okay, granted, we see it's a defensive response to the Muslim aggression, and so it wasn't, it wasn't as offensive as you know, some of us skeptics might have liked to believe. But it doesn't end there. We see a continued pattern of violence in the name of Christ ever since the very beginning of it. So you had, as soon as the church was able to take hold of any kind of power, they immediately, you could see, by using the Christian worldview, uh, corrupted things and, and created this environment of intolerance. Because you had the Pax Romana, this beautiful period of peace in Roman history where things were just fine because they accepted and tolerated other religions. All of a sudden, now the Christians come in charge and now there's all these, these, these killings because you didn't believe the way that the church wanted you to believe. In fact, they had another crusade that wasn't against the Muslims. It was the Albigensian Crusade in the early part of the 13th century where Christians went and slaughtered thousands of Christians because they didn't believe the way that the church wanted to believe. And really, it was whoever was in power got to dictate what you believe. And if you didn't believe it, you'd be burned at the stake. How's that for tolerance and love? Um, the Inquisitors were quite a cruel bunch. They would grab people without any sort of due process and just because of how they believed, and just because they were daring to believe a different way, would be killed for it, imprisoned, their stuff taken away, um, or kicked out altogether. The Jews were another thing. If you're a religious minority, you were oppressed, kicked out. Uh, you're not welcome here. Um, then we can go on to the suppression of knowledge. All over Spain and throughout Europe, they were burning books that didn't agree with the church. We all know what happened with Galileo. He came up and popularized the view of the, um, the earth not being the center. But what Copernicus said is that the sun was the center and that the planets and the solar system revolved around that. But that wasn't good enough for the church because of what the Bible said about the geocentric model. That since Ptolemy, the earth was the center of the universe. So they couldn't handle that change even though it was true. And it's not, it's, it's not friendly to science. Then you had even, if you think that the Protestants, us you know, Presbyterians here in this church, have it any better, well, guess again. We had somebody who was not in lockstep with the church, and John Calvin himself had part in the execution of Michael Servetus in Geneva. So it didn't end there. In fact, it got bloodier with the, uh, with the Reformation, and the religious wars continued. If that's not bad enough, Europeans had to colonize and go into the, the native people's lands of the Americas and convert them at the sword at risk of death. And we all know about the, the Salem witch trials that started in Europe and continued on into the colonies. So how can you say that that isn't what Jesus would do when after six or seven hundred years it was a consistent pattern ever since Christians took power? Um, just look at the period itself. It's called the Dark Ages, right? You know, the, the ancient times of Rome and Greece were at least where people were reasonable. And then there was this period of corruptness that the church brought upon society. Just in case for the newcomers. <laughs> and then after the period, people started to get it. It's called the Enlightenment, where people started to realize, why are we killing each other? Let's be tolerant. So that period between them is just the middle, hence the Middle Ages, right? Washington, D.C. is filled with classical architecture. You don't see Gothic architecture there. They knew better. That was a dark time, and now we know better. 
no more skeptic right now. That, uh, that didn't feel good. <laughs> but have you heard something along those lines? How could you be a Christian when there's nothing but war, violence, intolerance? We may brush it off, and we've talked about last time at the Crusades that we could say, look, people are sinful and people will fail. But look at Christ. <clears throat> and I think that's a good argument and a good place to start. But we don't want to dust under the rug what could be really sincere objections to people. And there's, we also don't want to be blind to the truth, right? Oh, the Inquisition, you know, that was bad, but I don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. Or, uh, no, there was nothing wrong with the Inquisition. That was fine. Well, you're going to lose credibility if, if you do that. And keep in mind that this is not something what we use as a defense for Christianity, right? This is not something that we're going to bring up and say, be a Christian because, hey, let me start with the Inquisition. No, it's not where you, where you start at all. In fact, it's going to be used as an objection to Christianity. And so then we respond. So if we use our proper tactics, we would say, what's the question if somebody says, you know, how can you be a Christian when there's the Inquisition? If you're a stu student of Greg Kokel or Stand to Reason, you read the book Tactics, the question is, what do you mean by that? Put it back to them. And often they will have misconstrued conceptions of history. That's why we're having this class, so we at least know the history of it. We're not going to go launch it into a lecture, but we will know, hopefully, a little bit more to be able to correct some misconceptions that even we have about what the Inquisition is. So what are the points that I rattled off here at wearing my skeptics hat, for those who just came into the room? Uh, Christian rulers brought intolerance. Uh, the church and state was interwoven into one entity. Uh, the Albigensian Crusade. The slaughter of fellow Christians who believed a little different. Um, power, whoever sat in the power seat of the royal crown or the, or the papal office, uh, dictated what people believed. Uh, the inquisitors were cruel torturers, unjust confiscators of property, and murdered innocent people. They suppressed knowledge, as in the case I brought up about Galileo and Michael Servetus. Uh, they oppressed religious minorities, like namely the Jews and Muslims. Uh, colonial conquest of America, of the Americas, when they're going to, on the Peruvian silver and, and Mexican gold, uh, and then the witch trials, of course. So keep those all in mind. We're going to revisit that at the very end, and uh, hopefully we'll touch on them. If you have other things that you've heard, uh, we, can, we can have a period, hopefully, at the end for questions. So we've got to start by saying, what is the Inquisition? Here are some inquisitors here, if you look real closely. Anybody see that? Everybody got a good look at that? Very suspicious. Okay, well, I always knew. But to understand Inquisition, we need to start off with what is heresy? Well, heresy is any, any straying from the truth. And it started way, way back. Back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, first talking about the story of the serpent at the, uh, at, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Who's that a quote by? Satan, right? The devil, that's right. Exodus 32, and this, it's easy to go in the Old Testament because people see a marvelous act of God and say, oh God, you're great. And then they stray and go the other way. And then they see him again and they go. And it's constant throughout when you read the text. Uh, you probably all remember this. Uh, Moses was taking too long talking to God up on the mountain. And uh, so the people went to Aaron and said, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what he's been... Oh boy, I can't see that. It has become of him. Thank you very much. And then in the New Testament, you see the writers addressing heresy, You're addressing false doctrine. And they do it many times. And here's just a couple of examples. For if, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians in his second letter. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or we receive a different spirit from which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet am not so in knowledge, in fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. Oops. Jude speaks, uh, did I skip one? Okay, yeah, Peter, I think this is the next one. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, 
who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Jude, three to four. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about your common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. That's a real apologetic message, right? Contend earnestly for the faith, which was once, all, once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So they had problems with people coming in and teaching things contrary to the apostles in, when they were putting Scripture to ink before the New Testament came and was there. Um, in in uh, Colossians, we're going through that with Pastor Steve, right? There's a ma- and Paul does this a lot. He really sets out his credentials in the beginning, saying that he's an apostle. And so he s- establishes that authority. And then when there's any sort of disagreement, there's the, in, in Colossians in particular... He goes into, if you read chapter 1 a couple times, he just really hammers it home that God is the creator from all time, the creator of all things. And so he really wanted to address that. Why? Well, a lot of the scholars speculate that the people that he was addressing were swept in by Gnosticism and this, this heresy that would deny God of the Bible as being the creator that matter is good. And we'll talk a little bit more about what Gnosticism is in a little bit. Um, Deuteronomy, way back going that far back in the Old Testament shows that there was a, I suppose you could say, intolerance for heresy way before the Christian church. Um, In fact, I would suggest every society has been intolerant in that sense um, as far as what you can and can't do as far as religious belief, including Rome. Deuteronomy 13.9 says, but you shall kill him in reference to what you do with a heretic. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. Titus. Titus 3, 10 to 11. As for a person, this is where Paul is speaking on how to handle it. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. Second John. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him partakes in his wicked works. Matthew 18 is the most lengthy treatment and the most interesting, especially in light of heresy. Because it doesn't start out speaking about heresy at all. In fact, the apostles come to him and say, who's going to be the greatest? You know, they're concerned with which one of them is going to be on the top, right? Who's going to be taking the seat? Um, in leadership. And then he, he says, go, go get me that, chil- that child. And then he brings the child and says, you know, anyone who humbles himself like this child will be great. And then he says, anyone who harms this child, it's better for him to be you know, cast into the sea and drown, right? And so why, why is that? Do what, what kind of harm doing to these little ones? Starting at verse 10 in, in chapter 18. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? He goes on to say, if you sin and your eye causes you sin, pluck it out. Um, And then he goes right into church discipline. And that is, the the, when there are two or three, uh, I will be there with you. Verse where we always take that out of context and say if there's two or three then we can worship together well it's church discipline in the context here it's it's leading people astray in heretical doctrine so he's laying out something that could be read into as is a organized method of addressing heresy and how were they doing this at this point keep in mind when this when the church started they had no control there was no power over government it was all just the church and they were they, they defaulted to the authorities at the time to rule those things of, of politics and policy and, and of the, the other powers that were non-theology related. It's, it's those people that did that. If you read Paul in, in um, Romans 13, you can see him pointing to others. Nowhere in Scripture, you can read it all, do they talk about how to govern as a Christian. It just wasn't 
something they thought about. It wasn't an issue. It would have been foolish because they were a minority at the time. So how do they wrestle with any sort of administrative issues? When people are wrong, and it's important that we're as accurate to the truth as we can be, and they knew that, more than we do today, actually, how do they, how, how do they ensure that the, the, the truth maintains throughout time? Well, it's easy when you had Jesus there. He would just tell you. And then the apostles were assumed to have authority. Everybody uh, knew the influence that the apostles had, so that was also a f fairly a given. And as the apostles started dying, there was those who they taught, the, the church fathers or the patriarchs, they were the ones that then took the baton. And that had to carry on throughout the years. And the way that they addressed it early on was, apologize for the fuzziness of this, but you had the main old Christian uh, cities, and this is representative of a little bit fast forwarded in time because we didn't have a whole lot there, at least in that city, but we have Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were the three main ones starting out, and then eventually, over the first thousand years, um, this made up the, the biggest portion of the old Christian world. And so you'd have a bishop in Rome, bishop in Alexandria, bishop in Jerusalem, Antioch, and Constantinople, and they would they would kind of run things for the church in these regional areas. Okay, you can kind of see it split up there. And these are a couple of little heresies we'll, we'll talk about that, that crept up in these areas. But they would handle them. So if the Arians came down here um, they, and, and there was an issue, the bishops would address it. So there's a church where you know, somebody starts talking about how Jesus really isn't God. Uh-oh, an Arian got to this area, so let's address it. And they would do it locally. Um, then things changed in the early 4th century when Constantine took over. Um, actually, he was already in power, but then he converted to Christianity. And what happened was he really thought that he was, Constantine thought that he was gifted by God as an administrator, as a governor, as a ruler, not as a churchman or a part of clergy. But he did accept Christianity and take it seriously and he was involved in some of the early councils, but he let the churches handle that. What also happened was a lot of people converted. When the power of the time takes on the religion, that's what naturally happens. At first, it was a lot of people mainly of lower classes uh, that were, were Christians. And then, now, everybody became Christian. And that's generally speaking. You had all segments of society represented, but it was m mainly the lower classes. But now everybody came into it. Um, so I need to talk about who we're, we're dealing with here and understand the people a little bit before we go much further down. So I'm going to pause here and talk about the middle-aged man. Some of you may be thinking this when you think of <laughs> middle-aged man. That's not what we're here to talk about, as funny as it may be, okay? <laughs> Still middle-aged though, right, Todd? <laughs> So, um, let's see, did I, oh boy. Oh, this is really touchy. Sorry, Todd. Everybody saw that. Okay. So, my, my terms may not be real precise, but they are distinct categories that typically don't overlap, and they're, they're, they're different segments of society that we need to recognize. So, the, starting with the commoners, most people were peasants. So, so they were laborers on, on lands, or they were servants of some kind, both men and women, uh, and so th that would be like the, the most of us. Uh, the nobles would be wealthy merchants, um, uh, relatives of royalty like princes and things like that, um, and so the nobles would be uh, the people that are the landowners, the people kind of running the show for their immediate area. Royalty would be the, the king or queen who's in charge of administering that whole region. So there, the buck stops there as far as ruling the area. And then you have the clergy, which is distinct from royalty. These are two different, completely different offices. The clergy is what it sounds like. It's the priests, the bishops, and ultimately what became the pope in Rome. And then you separate out the heretics, the people that rejected the church, um, and they were distinct, and they were heretics. And I'll tell you why they set themselves apart from the rest is in a minute. And then you, lastly, you had foreigners who were either visiting, uh, were from somewhere else, and uh, they're almost always non-Christian. So they'd be Muslims or Jews for the most part. So when you had this influx of Christianity, you had all 
phases of life coming into the mix now. So it wasn't, it, 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 it brought an interesting dynamic. Now you had Christianity being the cool thing. And it wasn't that special. When something's oppressed and something's, you're the minority, it's different, right? Than when everybody's doing it and everybody's Christian and it's real just expected in, in culture. So the whole dynamic changed. And what happened was a couple different reactions to that. One, heresy crept into the churches all over the place like crazy. And so you had churches going in different directions. And then those regions I showed you before would then be affected more than other regions. So Rome may have the Aryan problem, the Donatists down in Alexandria may be a problem down there. And now you had a real shift in, and a, a, you're, you're losing control of what the right doctrine is, right? Um, and, and the other thing, let's see, okay, so you have lots of different heresies, and you also have a lot of people that just didn't know any better because you have a lot of people that are illiterate. The, all, everything's in Latin, so you don't have ability to even study if you wanted to. So heresy just was a natural re reaction to the, the, the reality of the circumstances. And these are some of them. Gnosticism goes by lots of different names because there's subsets of that, and it's a lot of Greek philosophy that comes into it, and it basically says there's two worlds. The world of matter, like physical stuff, and the spiritual. And that everything good is spiritual. Matter is either um, a a necessity, but a, a unliked necessity, or it's something that we just want to separate from as much as possible, and we want to focus all on the spiritual. That's the first phase of it. The second phase of Gnosticism was commonly that there's some sort of secret knowledge. You needed some secret, like passwords or something, to be able to get, once you die, into the afterlife to pass certain obstacles. So you can see a lot of the Greek mythology creeping into that. It was also very appealing to the elites and the wealthy because they wanted to be separate. And we're, we're even cooler than the regular Christians because everybody's Christian, but we've got this secret knowledge. And so it was very popular there. It was also popular because the people in charge had the luxury of being able to thumb their nose at Rome a little bit or the other bishops because they were in power and they had a little bit more control. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about some, some Gnostic heresies. Arianism is, I don't know how to put it better than this, but Jehovah's Witness uh, are, are very consistent with Arianism. Um, Arian believed that Jesus was a, uh, the first created being. Uh, he was great, but he was not divine. and He was not part of God. God was one, and God was Yahweh, and that was it. There's no son that is equal with the Father. And that's what the early Council of Nicaea addressed, one of the many things. Uh, the Donatist. Uh, Donatism was a response to the, uh, the persecution in the church. We spoke last time that created some of the penance system where if you said, no, 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 I'm pagan, hail Caesar, and you spared your life, where the guy next to you said, I believe in Christ and I cannot recant that, and they would be executed, burned, flayed, you know, fed to the beast. When everybody goes back to church on Sunday, you're sitting next to the widow who just lost her husband, and then you got the guy that said, no, 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 hail Caesar. How do you address that? Well, the Donatist, and you can sympathize with this a little bit, and some of these things that I'm going to tell you, you can, you can po possibly, don't feel like you're a heretic, because you might actually resonate with some of the things. Um, the Donatist thought, well, we understand that man is sinful, but... It, it, there's a scripture verse that says that uh, you, if you sin against the Son of Man, you'll be forgiven, but if you sin against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. They, they applied that to that that was a mortal sin that, that cannot be forgiven. If you, for, if you reject the Holy Spirit and you, to spare your life, you will not be forgiven. And the problem got worse. If that person then became a priest then the sacraments are no good. Nothing's valid. We cannot respect that. And then if you also ordain other priests, you can see how the, the cancer spreads. It's like a computer virus. Now, now it, all of those priests, even though they did nothing wrong, they may have even been you know, subject to the persecution, but they are, don't count because it was a, a, a heretical priest, somebody who denied Christ, that then you know, appointed that, that, that uh, priest. So that was a division. Donatists then separated themselves, and they, they wanted all of these. That's, that's the other common denominators. They separated themselves from the main church. And lastly, uh, Waldensianism. Uh, Waldes was a wealthy merchant who, um, and often it wasn't just elites that liked these heresies. It was also merchant areas where you had travelers coming and going. 
and a lot of wealth in these areas in like Venice, northern Italy, southern France, a lot of southern France. Uh, I think Waldese was in southern France, but then moved up, the movement kind of took itself up to the Alps. Waldensianism wanted to reject the sacraments except for baptism and communion. Um, they wanted to uh, respond to the common everybody's a Christian movement to a life of aestheticism so that they wanted to be like the monks and poor and took vows of poverty. And they also separated themselves from the church because they saw these uh, austere salaries and lifestyles of the people in clergy. And as you hear me speaking, you're thinking, what's wrong with that? Well, <laughs> there's a lot to the, some of these heresies that sound appealing in that um, the main problem was that they were not compatible with, with the church at the time. And so any, any deviation from what the church and the bishops were teaching was deemed heretical. So what's the big deal? Well, we've got to remember that there were no nation states then like we have today. There was no America, there was no France, there was no Germany, there was no Spain. Sure, they were there and they were called that and there were regions, but the control wasn't there. It shifted, whoever the king was. Take Spain, for example. There's probably three large regions of Spain. And those areas were controlled each by kings. And so it wasn't until they unified with a marriage in the 15th century where they were combined into one big unified Spain. That similar kind of dynamic played out through the rest of Europe where it was all segmented. Everybody was a Christian, keep in mind. And that is the foundation for the government. Now, they were separate. The clergy is separate from those ruling class. But it was all on the foundation of the Christian gospel. And if you rejected that, then that meant you rejected that nation and, and the foundations for that rule of law. And so it was akin to treason. You're not one of us. You are a threat to the infrastructure, the social order, the civil order. We have to address this. And it wasn't the church that addressed it. Never once did the church execute anybody. It was the civil authorities, the, the, um, the rulers of the secular realm that would then execute. And so they would have their hearings, and I'm going to go into what the hearings were, but they would turn them over, relax them to the secular courts. Um, and they would take the ruling of the expert theologians who found out that they were speaking or teaching uh, something heretical and aren't willing to recant or aren't willing to see the uh, correction that the secular uh, courts would then say, okay, we, we defer to their theological expertise. Now we are the government, and we say you're a threat, you're treasonous, you're admitted as such, and they would, they would um, punish them usually by burning. Okay, so combating heresy, how do they do it? How is it split up? Well, it, initially, as I said, would start with the bishops, Rome, Alexandria, um, Antioch, and then on to others. But after a while, then, the royals, the, the queens and kings of these areas would then see that this is something that if it's not happening according to how they like it or if they want to do it or not do it according to how, uh, how they like their dynamic in their local area, uh, they wanted the control. They, they would get involved and have their inquisition. So you, at, at a certain point, about the uh, 12th, 13th century, you had two simultaneous inquisitions. The bishops of the church having their inquisition and then the, the crown of the area, the kings and queens would have theirs. The trouble is, people really would um, see these as being the most, uh, the, the most uh, strict form of inquisition. So you had the, the locals because they were in charge, they wanted to be in, in control of their little area, and if there was somebody they didn't like, they could go and get them and call them a heretic, and there was, there was a, a, not a real formalized system of doing that. They would just go and get them. Um, so the, what happened was a lot of people would appeal to Rome. They would say, hey, this is unjust, I'm not a heretic, or they were just coming out to get me, or it wasn't fair, and they would appeal to Rome. And when the papal inquisition came to town, everybody would welcome them. They would say, this is great. And they were known, the, the papal inquisition was known as being very lenient. And so they were not afraid at all. In fact, a lot of people really wanted the Inquisition to come because they were so, religion was important to them and they really did want to get it right. But the abuses with the local bishops and the crowns were, it was, it was a refreshing visit that they had from the, from the Pope. 
I'm really giving a lot at you, so if you think of questions along the way, just write them down. We're going to get to that in a minute. But I, I do have to cover the Albigensian Crusade and what the Cathars were. Put simply, the Cathars were a, um, a, a Gnostic sect. And they believed, again, that matter was bad and that the spirit is good. That Jesus wasn't even matter, because he couldn't be, because matter is bad. And God was good. Jesus was good. And so when he was here, he wasn't even real. He was, he was just an apparition, something that you could see, but he was just spirit being. The God that they want to tell you was the Old Testament, and the creator God is the bad God, and he created all the matter. It's the new God that, that we want to follow. So it was a very big divergence from traditional Christianity. Um, and there's others. There's uh, uh, Valentinus, not the Val St. Valentines. Um, there was uh, Marcion uh, long, long ago. But they were believing this, and it was very popular again in the merchant areas of uh, Venice and southern France, and they, they really would be among the elite, really want to thumb their, their nose at, at Rome, and they really, even if they wouldn't be Cathars like uh, Richard of Toulouse in southern France, he, he just liked the fact that they were rebels, and the Pope didn't like that at all, and he would try to tell them they need to correct their ways, and they wouldn't do it, and uh, he sent a po uh, papal legate, he would send an ambassador from Rome representing the, the Pope himself, and he was executed when he went there. And that was the final straw. I'm really cutting this short to the final straw, but they killed the papal representative, and Richard of Toulouse didn't deny doing it and spoke well of the event. And so that was it, and they said, we have to go and correct this. This is a cancer. This is ruining people's salvation because it's a heresy and it has to be rooted out. They went down there and there was thousands that were killed. And that's the reality of it. The Albigensian Crusade did happen. Um, and that's some of the context for it. By the way, I'm not here, to, if you had any hopes of defending the Inquisition, I'm not here to do that. I'm just here to clarify a little bit about what it is so you're prepared when it comes up. Now, the Middle Age man uh, really focused on truth at the expense of civil liberties. That's why they were so happy when they came to town to get rid of the heretics, because they wanted truth, and they knew religion was so important, like we talked about last month with the Crusades, that death was right at your doorstep, and they knew that if you didn't take religion seriously, it'd be too late because you didn't know when you'd die. It was a time where it was really tough. They didn't have the medicine. There's lots of disease, lots of war, and so they took religion very seriously, and so they are willing to sacrifice certain personal liberties. So they're willing to have the, the inquisitors come, question, in prison, um, to get at the truth. Again, not a defense, but a value that we want to be clear about. Now comes the inquisitors. Before this, it was just the bishops, the, the royalty, and then the pope just starts getting into it, and they send out inquisitors. The first one was out of Regensburg, Germany, where the pope, um, I think it was... I'm trying to remember if it was Pope Sixtus, I think, out of Germany in the early 13th century, sent out this pope to be able to go see. He gave him authority to go seek out heresy and address it from the authority of the pope because it was getting so many appeals and so many complaints about the other inquisitions that were going on. The inquisitors were very organized because before this, it was really after the fall of Rome, there was chaos in the legal system. Um, where there wasn't the Roman law, which was very precise and very orderly. Well, when the Pope came in with the Inquisition, they wanted to return to that Roman law code, and so they were very judicious in how they did it. In fact, they created manuals, these Inquisition manuals, the most famous being by uh, Bernard Guy, G-U-I, who in 13-something uh, created the manual that was carried on. There was a couple other manuals, but they were very specific in how you address the crime, what steps in the process you take to, from, from the investigation into the, the tribunal process. Um, and they followed it to the letter. In 1998, there was, the Vatican released a lot of records. And it was records that the inquisitors never thought historians would look at. They were, they were just detailing, as they did in Roman law, every step of the process. And it showed that they were following this to the letter. Um, so it was, that was the intent, to be very clean about it versus just willy-nilly with the bishops and, and the royals. And we also get an insight to their motivation. In these writings, and you can search them yourself, and if you type in Bernard Guy or if you type in Inquisitor Manual, and you find the actual manual, there's a lot of 
stuff written in the Enlightenment that took out all just the bad stuff to, to paint it in a certain light. But if you find the actual manuals, you'll see that they take the time to write out, we are concerned that this is going to hurt them for eternity. And if they don't recant and they don't allow to be corrected, that they will lose their salvation and those around them. So they saw it as being a sort of soul doctor. That's Thomas Madden's term, um, who, who uh, has a great lecture series on this, by the way. So a little bit about the tribunal process, and we'll wrap this up. There was two or three, probably from the Matthew 18 passage, that would travel around. There were mendicants, which were either Dominican or Franciscan uh, theologians, experts in the law of theology. And they would have legal advisors, people familiar with the Roman law code, and then guards. Now, I told you before that everybody was happy that they came to town. Everybody, that is, except for the local authorities. The bishops and the kings and queens did not like the papal inquisition coming to town because it questioned their local control. They would start by giving a sermon, usually announcing their authority, and then also um, the, the, the basics of the gospel, just a basic gospel message. These people are not reading their Bibles because they're illiterate or they can't read Latin. And so this is their chance to really lay down some groundwork before they go any further. Then there's a grace period, usually two to four weeks, where they would say, over this period, come to us, confess your, your sin, or confess where you might be wrong from what we just gave you on this, this sermon on basic Christianity, and you'll be forgiven without any, without any questions. Uh, the fourth period is if you don't do that, then they start getting... Um, word from either accusers, witnesses, or general what they called fama, which was rumor about people that might be straying or teaching false doctrine, whether it's intentional or not. And so then they would go on to questioning, and they would have investigators. These two or three mendicants would ask questions as experts in theology. Would, they would know where you're, where you're off. And then in a first like, preliminary hearing, they would have a witness and evidence presented so they would have all the evidence brought to this, uh, the, this tribunal for the two or three mendicants that were running it, and they would uh, present the case. Then, if they were found guilty, there would be like an indictment. It was a written uh, verdict of their guilt, or at least a preliminary uh, probable cause statement. And it's funny because a lot of this is similar to what I work with as an investigator. You have the grand jury process ahead of time, and then a trial to follow. And they're summons. They're sent a piece of paper to say, you've been found uh, not guilty, but you've been accused of heresy. Uh, here's your tribunal trial date. And what they would have to do is there's partial proof and full, full proof. Partial proof would be like circumstantial evidence. Um, if, if you were, if somebody else heard, there's no eyewitness testimony, but somebody else heard that you said such and such or you taught this or that, or if... Um, uh, there's just not a direct observation. But if you have a lot of those, that could find you guilty in secular courts for minor offenses. The problem was heresy was a capital crime because the secular courts would kill you for it. And so they needed a full proof. And that is I, at least two eyewitness statements. Partial proof would be only if there's just one eyewitness statement. But if you have two eyewitness statements, um, and, uh, and then you'd have other partial proofs as well. Torture would come into it, as it would worldwide, by the way, if the partial proofs is all you had and you, you needed a, a confession. And so what they would do is with all these partial proofs of all these people saying that you're, you're a heretic, they would then apply short amounts of torture with the hopes that you would confess. If you did confess, you would have to then confirm that not under duress, not under torture later. Um, you could always say, no, I was being tortured, I wasn't really, I'm not really a heretic. Uh, sometimes they would torture you a second time to, to try again, but if they wouldn't get anywhere, then they would, would stop at that point. But it's, according to the records, it's extremely rare. Um, and again, much more lenient than the secular courts, by the way. Um, the capital crime nature of, of, uh, of heresy I, I mentioned. And then at the end, after all of this, they would give you a chance to correct your ways or if you cannot recant and you must stand firm, then they would hand you over to the secular court and they would normally take all of your, your stuff and, and, and burn you. Uh, it is important that even in the Spanish Inquisition later, there was not an enrichment of, of, of these confiscations, which is commonly one of the myths. It was typically to just keep the process going because it was an ex expensive process to keep these traveling mendicants and their staff out there 
and to have these, uh, these trials. Not that it excuses it at all. Oops, man, that's sensitive. So the Spanish Inquisition, just uh, a little bit about it, which is a huge, huge thing, has been the, the target of lots of popular culture and, um, and medieval uh, um, art as well. So there, there's art, there's plays. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe uh, did a poem on it with the Pit and the Pendulum. And, uh, and there's most recently, I think in the 70s, the uh, Name of the Rose uh, was a, uh, a movie in a, based on a book. And so there's a lot of uh, plays, operas, things that, that came out of the Spanish Inquisition. And it's probably the most misunderstood as well. There was the interesting thing about the Spanish Inquisition is it works both as an example of how the Inquisition evolved and so how it became some, a, a tool of the royalty, of the, of the crown of Spain, rather than something controlled by the church. Um, but it also had some nuances because Spain was one of the most diverse, uh, multiculturally diverse uh, societies in all of Europe, probably all of the world. Uh, Jews would be expelled, there's anti-Semitism going on all over Europe, and they'd be expelled, and so they found their home usually in Spain or Italy. But when they found their place in Spain, they had a long period there where they were at peace. Uh, a lot of Muslims there, because the Muslim invasion there left a lot of Muslims there. Uh, they kept fighting the Muslims, but people kind of made it their home after a while. And so there's a Muslim population, there was Jewish population. And there was, as a result of this multiculturalism, you had a lot of new Christians. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, the local people would go out with the pitchforks and force baptisms. And the, the clergy would say, you guys are crazy. You can't force baptisms. But the people that didn't know any better would force baptisms. And a lot of people just remained a Christian for whatever reason. It might have been easier back then. But they converted. A lot of them converted from Judaism or, or Islam to Christianity. And now you had these, this new class of people uh, that was in the middle. They weren't the foreigners or the non-Christians. They weren't the Christians, but they were new Christians, and they were treated separately. The biggest group of these was the, known as the conversos. It was former Jews who had converted. And it wasn't just those who converted, because 100 years would go by, and now it's grandpa converted, but I've been two generations now a Christian. But they had this weird culture where it's not really weird today, because we do it all the time today, but it was weird then, where they still would take a lot of their Jewish culture, their dress, their uh, things they would eat, and they, their, their lifestyle, but be Christians, and they'd be sincere Christians. But with the people and the power at the time, there was a lot of jealousy, and there was a lot of a rumor that, first of all, the Jews were poisoning the wells, which is what caused the, the, the Black Death you know, with the, the plague. And, and if the Jews weren't bad enough, well, these new Christians, they're no better. In fact, they're worse. They're trying to get into Spanish government and take over from within. And these rumors circulated to where there was a lot of pressure on the king to do something about those conversos. So in the, um, I'm a little lax on my dates, but I think it's uh, towards 1400 or so, there was an ex expelling of the Jews when Isabel and Ferdinand married in joint Spain. One of the early things they did was to kick the Jews out. You must leave. Some of them converted to conversos, so there's more conversos, and some of them left. Um, but the other thing was that the conversos created this problem, whether it was real or not, there was pressure on the crown to do something. And so they developed their own inquisitor, um, Torquemada, who's, who's you know, one of the renowned, the great inquisitor, the, the, the big evil inquisitor, who would go around for 14 years and would execute about two to 3,000 of these conversos. And there was, they were told either you say that you are a converso or recant. And either way they did it, the problem seemed worse. And so it just kind of manifested itself. Pope Sixtus, followed by Pope Innocent IX, both wrote letters trying to urge the king to stop this. And it was not a Roman papal inquisition. It was something that the local powers were, were doing on their own, but it was getting out of hand. And the king, uh, Ferdinand, he, he would respond to the pope, accusing him of being bribed. And he basically said, shut up, let me handle this. And there was nothing at that point the Pope could do about it. Keep in mind, Spain was probably the wealthiest country, the wealthiest empire possibly in history because of the gold and silver they were getting in the New World. They were all over Europe, parts of Italy, into the Netherlands, France. They had a large area. And they were in the Americas, so there was a lot of wealth there. The Pope just couldn't do anything about it. It lasted until 1834. So that, that, that's why the skeptic had earlier was a little upset that it's been happening for so long. 
the Reformation. Uh, this is uh, this is another heresy in the eyes of the church. Uh, Luther went to the Diet of Worms fully prepared to be burned at the stake, uh, but he had something on his side. He, although had this heresy that the church just could not stand for, and he would not recant. He was uh, he had friends in high places, and this was a time where the invasion of the Turks required the full attention of, I think it was Charles V, who was not about to be distracted. He needed all the support from these nobles that he could, and for whatever reason, he was not burned, and the Reformation took off. Now, it's interesting that w when I was writing a paper in grad school, I wrote a truism, and that was that the, the, the heretics that died at the stake were fewer than the Lutherans and the Protestants who also died. So if you accuse me of being one of these inquisitors or being a Christian who comes from this heritage, you are mistaken because the Protestants also died at the stake. And that is true. But what also happened, and we need to recognize, is that if any Catholics were in those now Protestant areas, so starting in Germany, uh, where you had princes that adopted Lutheranism, and Lutheranism was the term for Protestant, Protestantism, generally speaking, um, they would then be the inquisitors of the Catholics. So that did happen both ways. Namely, uh, with uh, the, most, the most notable, with, with the John Calvin in Geneva, who wasn't from Geneva, he was, I think, French, right? And he uh, rightly, you know, he condemned Michael Servetus, who was preaching a form of, I think, Arianism. So it was Unitarianism, God is one, Jesus can't be part of that. And so it was definitely at odds with Trinitarian theology, the very foundation of, of the Christian gospel. And so he condemned him, but then it was the, the city council and the secular arm that burned him at the stake. So that's an example of the, the Protestant Reformation being involved in an inquis inquisition type of event. Um, there, there's also the Galileo incident that I mentioned before. And Luther had choice words for the Copernicus and, and Galilean method of heliocentric model, where the sun's at the center, because of scripture so often referring to the earth as the center, with the sunrise, the sunset, and uh, terms like that. Um, but it was the Catholic Church that had a problem not with the science. They didn't have a problem with that. In fact, they had, they, they had um, observatories, papal observatories, and the Pope was very interested in it. That Galileo was a personal friend of the Pope when he got into the most trouble. It wasn't the science at all. In fact, they were open to it and they were exploring other truth. In fact, the Catholic Church doesn't put all of their eggs into the scripture basket. They also have tradition, so they, can, they have some wiggle room to say, well, we don't even need to pay attention to these verses anyway because we can just say what we want from the, papal from the papal chair. So they're very open to it, where Luther wasn't. And it was when Galileo started justifying and trying to say, well, the Bible doesn't really say that. This is what the Bible means. He entered into theology where it wasn't something he was trained in. And they just applied the, the Inquisition to that. It was the Roman Inquisition at that point to say that you are a heretic because you're straying from, from the doctrine. It wasn't that we're scared of science or that we're not accepting what your scientific discoveries show which were lacking. They said, you're not right with your predictions, which he wasn't. He was off. He thought there was, well, I'm not going to go into the details, but it wasn't a scientific dispute at all. So when your friends say you're suppressing knowledge, um, that's not what they were doing at all. The Enlightenment came in a, in a period where, after a long time, where there was wars, uh, the Huguenots and the Catholics and the Anabaptists and all these groups were fighting each other, and they couldn't just kill enough of them. Reformation was another heresy, but it was unlike anything they've ever seen before. When I say heresy, heresy for the Catholic Church perspective. And so the, the school of thinkers called the Philosophes came about to say, why are we doing this? We are killing men. We are not killing ideas. And so they came, after a while, that thinking got up into the leadership of Europe, and they, they, they just became in this culture of more, more tolerance. And so that truth and civil liberties shifts started occurring. And we see that today continue to shift. Um, and it's interesting how far that pendulum can swing. Oops. So when this comes up, I think it's important to focus on the main ideas. What can we really take away from the Inquisition? Not that they did everything right or that it didn't happen. 
that both of those would be wrong options. But what is the main issue with the Inquisition? When your friend brings it up, why was it bad? That's why I asked the question. Not to say, hey, what's wrong with the Inquisition anyway? No, what's wrong with the Inquisition, right? Let's think about the main issue. So what was their motivation? Well, we see in the writings themselves, it seems to be, it's, where they didn't know anybody would read these, keep in mind, a sincere intent on saving souls. National loyalty. We don't take that lightly today, right? I mean, I'm in the business where other coworkers of mine investigate threats um, of people that are speaking friendly of ISIS or interest in, in ISIS and to go overseas to possibly engage or to speak boldly here about how uh, ISIS should, you know, is justified in what they're doing, that kind of thing. Um, we, we don't take that lightly. It's, it's, it's very similar then. It's a threat to the stability of the state. Treason. Treason is punishable, right? It's still a capital crime here. Um, and then truth. Truth and liberty. Those are the two that work at odds. You know, we're, we are of the Enlightenment, and our founding and our country has some Enlightenment underpinnings. And part of that is the innocent until proven guilty. So we, are rather, we would rather give civil liberties than have the truth in some cases. We'll let a guilty person go free at the expense of not having an innocent person charged, right? So that's one example. Um, there, there's, uh, we want to see our accusers. We have a right to face our accusers. Uh, in the Inquisition, that wasn't the case. You could have secret witnesses, and they'd still get the truth, right? But that's a violation of civil, li civil liberties. So there's that truth and liberty um, at, at odds. And then tolerance. What, what, what kind of state is the most tolerant? I mean, even Rome. You're, you're saying that you're accepting all of these religions um, because they're polytheistic. Well, that was easy for a lot of those polytheists to then just add on and say, Hail Caesar, he's another god too. But the Christians couldn't. So they were not so tolerant to the Christians, were they? Um, and then authority. If you want to say everybody should, you know, they're, they're, Christians can be Christians no matter what your doctrine is, um, and there's nobody really teaching, there's no teachers, that, then how do you maintain any kind of truth? They, they, there has to be some sort of authority to, to guide people in what is actually true, and that goes beyond theology. Oops, gosh, oh boy. Can you help me out here? That's not a slide. <laughs> Thank you. So these are some of the things the skeptic earlier with my skeptic hat brought up and if you've got others and I'm sure you do or clarification on something that we talked about here today I want to I want to flesh this out and I want you to ask questions if something didn't sound right I may have made a mistake along the way too by the way so so ask me call me on that let's let's have a discussion afterwards here's the way to reach us reason why group page that'll keep you updated on events and that's going to tell you what's happening next. We'll talk about um, uh, things relevant that's happening now. That's the whole nature of the class. Anything hot right now we want to talk about. And then my email address if you need to reach me. Again, if you have ideas for the conference next year or if you want to just ask questions you don't feel comfortable with, with the group asking. Uh, if I call you a heretic right here and you felt bad, you can complain. Um, that's how you reach me.